department. A lot of there's that guy in high school that everyone cheered for when you bought the cart with the TV and uh, VCR, and you knew you were going to be able to watch a movie uh, that day in class. But uh, we're uh, in a work of progress, and so if you find the noise is too low, too high, Steve has told me he will be the one to tell me uh, raise it up or shut it down. So, uh, we have a, a number of reasons to be grateful, a number of reasons to be prayerful, and we want to just encourage everyone to look at the bulletin. Ruben, were you back last week, Ruben? Were you here last week? No. So I glad to have you. I wasn't here either, so I'm glad to have you back from your, uh, you and Josh from your vacation in Jamaica. Hope you had a good time. Glad that you're back here safely. Want to remember this Wednesday, Gary is going for his uh, knee replacement surgery in London, and so we uh, pray for him and uh, speedy recovery. Want to remember, of course, Jess Hodges in our prayer uh, prayer list as well, and all others that are listed. Continue to remember them in prayer. Uh, Rebecca has asked for a special prayer as she has gone back to Toronto. She has a job interview uh, a couple hours north of Toronto. So uh, she may be gone for a number of months, but uh, this is a good opportunity for her. So if we keep Rebecca in our prayers, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Some good news. Uh, Steve was telling me that yesterday uh, his grandson Abbott was baptized at Camp Oma. And so uh, that's a very happy moment for him, but also for all of us. And uh, we're thankful for that. That leads me to also say, Ronnie, if you want to just raise your hand or whatever. He was baptized on Tuesday and joins the family of God here at West Side. So we're very, very grateful for that. And he has a prayer request as well. Tomorrow he has a, an interview with the immigration agent uh, hoping to get work permit so he can be allowed to work here. So we want to keep longing our prayers uh, today and tomorrow. Um, Queen's pretty happy today, I think. Her father and her brother are visiting with us. Do you want to just rise? Do you want to introduce yourself to us? I'm honored to be Good morning. And Nessa. Say it, please. Yes. SMA. SMA. So I got the SMA and her brother. So we're very happy to have you here today. Next week, there is a breakfast social at 10 a.m. before service. September the 10th. Uh, we are going to resume our Sunday Bible study hour, and there's also going to be a potluck lunch following the morning service. And today is their ladies' book club meeting, so today as well, for all the ladies interested, there's a book club meeting uh, following the services. So uh, we'll call on our brother now to us in prayer. Okay. Thank you. 
take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Lord.
goals and goals and actions of the temple, strengthening those who are in the fire, sanctifying the place of perfection. How much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offer himself to our friendship with God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. On that sixth death has taken place for redemption of the transgressions that were committed after the first covenant. Those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never enforced by the one who was made it. Therefore, even the first covenant was not a man created without God. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses or the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats, the water, the scarlet bull, and the hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle. All the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may also say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness in it. Therefore, the necessary for the topic of the things in heaven to be cleansed with these, the heavenly things themselves to be made sacrifices and these. For Christ did not enter a holy place to gave his hands, and then copy of the true one, and in heaven itself. How to appear in the presence of God for us. Now was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own? Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Now, once at the consummation of the ages, he had been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As much going to make the life on. After this, on the judgment. So Christ, also having offered once to bear the sins of men, shall appear a second time for salvation with a reference to sin. To go to be great. So now for continuous good cup, the sun, the blood, this cup, the six, the
the crying in Israel. The fact that the son agreed to allow himself to hang for our sins. Pray that as we partake of the sacrifice of the Lord, we might remember the sacrifice that we might do so in accordance with your will. In the same name we pray. Father, we're thankful for the great God that you are. You continue to be merciful unto us. You continue to bless us in so many different ways. We thank you for loss. We thank you for all that you have given us for God. The Lord has saved the earth with the Lord and the fullness thereof. Which indicates to us that all things belong unto you. So we are thankful, dear God, that you have blessed us with these things, dear God, and we ask that you might yield us as we continue to give back to you a portion of that which you have blessed us with. Help us that we might not only give of our means only, but that we might give of our being, of our time. Help us, dear God, that we may continue to serve you in a manner that is pleasing unto you. Pray that you might bless the offering that has been collected. Pray that you might bless its use. Bless those who make decisions with regards to the use of these funds, dear God. And pray that you might help that we continue to serve you, to do your work, dear God, in the vineyard. Help us that we may continue to honor you and glory, honor your name, for we serve you. Let's just be great. Let's have a great Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. I trust that you enjoyed my favorite preacher last Sunday, and he, uh, Russ is a very special person in my life, and you know, I was thinking, he is my favorite preacher, but I've only heard him preach two times in uh, my entire life, and so I've heard him less than most times other people that I've ever heard, usually when we're together, we're together during the week, or when we're together, I'm the one speaking, and he has to endure listening to me, but he is my favorite preacher. He is someone that uh, took over, if you will, a place in my life that was left vacant by my grandfather, Sarah's father, and uh, Aubrey Hibber. They had been called home to God, and all of a sudden, Russ was there, and we the next 20-some years, Russ became the guy that got a phone call from me. Russ, I need your advice. And uh, he thought, he has a grandson named Drew. And so he always, his secretary always said, see, Russ is fancy. He has a secretary. Some of us do more work. We don't need secretary. But anyways, he always, his secretary would say, Drew's on the phone. And so he thought it was his grandson. Russ would say, hi, Drew, how are you? I said, I'm so good, how are you? I thought he was so happy to hear from me, but he was always disappointed when he found out it was the other group. But anyways, he's a great guy, and I hope we were blessed by hearing him. Um, I heard he got surprised by a surprise slide that someone put into his sermon uh, last week. And I was hoping the Lord would inform him of that. I'm in the point in my life for the last few years 
because of health reasons, that everything I eat is a calculation. There's nothing really that I don't have to calculate. If I eat this, what's going to happen? Or if I eat this, then I must make sure I also eat this and so on and so on. And I have to do it because it's going to be misery if I don't do it like that. And then all of a sudden, I get this moment where my mother, my wife, or even my daughters now, prepare something that makes the calculations obsolete. And I rue it the following week, but the smell, the look, the thought, just diving into that means I'm just going to enjoy this and I'm not going to think about the consequences afterwards. And, you know, that's often how when we're children in our purity and our innocence, we arrive at things, right? There's ice cream in front of us and we just dive in and eat it as kids. As adults, we say, well, what's this going to do to me if I eat even a, 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 a cup full of it, right? There's a difference, right? They just dive in. Like, have you ever heard someone talk about Jesus and the passion that they talk about doesn't overcome the purpose, but actually is part of the purpose, that they just want to talk to you about what Jesus means to them, and they just all of a sudden are so filled with passion that they're not calculating anything, they're just saying, let me talk to you about what Jesus means to me. And I wonder how often we just talk about Jesus. We sing about Jesus, and we can often do a great job of singing with passion. There are songs that come up, and we're not calculated about how we're singing. We just sing it, because this is what it means to me. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And we're so filled with passion when we sing that. And sometimes it just doesn't talk about Jesus. I'm trying to just talk about Jesus. I was thinking the last couple of weeks about some of the great preachers that I've been able to listen to. And as I was thinking about this, there were four sermons. All the sermons I've ever heard. There were four sermons. I can remember exactly where I was. I can remember exactly the date. 1988, 1997, 1998, and 2007. I'm not saying they're the only four sermons that I've heard. But these four sermons, I felt like I was being transported into a higher plane as the preacher just spoke about Jesus. No point in this, just plain speaking about Jesus. It was J.C. Bailey, it was Jim McGuigan, it was Alan Hires, and the best of all was Jimmy Allen. Jimmy Allen brought tears out of me that I couldn't even control when he was speaking. But here's the thing. There is no one I have ever heard, read from, or seen who comes close to the apostle Paul. There's no one who speaks about Jesus the way the apostle Paul speaks about Jesus. The language Paul uses. Other people can study his words and repeat his words. But no one comes up with the words about Jesus like the Apostle Paul does. The language he uses when he tells a group of Christians of what they have in Jesus is incomparable. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your version might say, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, 
to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel or the good news of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession to the praise of his Lord. And we will I'll say it. In conclusion, that's pretty powerful. Who can speak? Who can speak? The history, when Paul writes to this church in Ephesus, the history of the introduction of Jesus to the people in Ephesus can be discovered in Acts chapters 18 through 20, which would not have been written by the, by this time when this letter was being delivered to the church in Ephesus. You know, we are pretty privileged, right? That like we can say, let's turn here and let's turn here. But if you went to the church in Ephesus and say, hey, why don't we turn in our Bible? They'd say, well, what are you talking about? They wouldn't have had any of this. And when you discover the introduction of Jesus to the city of Ephesus in Acts chapters 18, 19, and 20. See, in chapter 18, near the end of Acts, a powerful preacher by the name of Apollos brings messages about Jesus to the city, but he only knows the baptism of John. He doesn't know Christian baptism. And so in Acts chapter 19, the apostle Paul comes along, and he notices there's something lacking among the disciples at Ephesus. And what's lacking is the Holy Spirit. And because they're lacking the Holy Spirit, he says, well, what were you baptized in? Well, they were baptized into John's baptism, which had its purpose. But now you need to be baptized into Jesus. And you need the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this plays a powerful part in the letter to Ephesus, or the, or the Ephesian letter that we're making today. It's very significant. And later in chapter 19, we read of a great conflict. Because the city of Ephesus was known for its worship of Artemis, or as the Romans called her, Diana. Artemis the Great. And see, the thing about Ephesus was there was a meteorite that fell from heaven. They thought that was Artemis sending them a lucky stone. And they believed that as they worshiped Artemis, good things happened. What are you going to do when someone says, hey, I went and offered a sacrifice to Artemis, and boom, I got $5 million. What are you? We would say, well, that's a coincidence, but how do you argue? How do you argue? Artemis the Great. Artemis the Great. And here comes these people preaching about Jesus, telling us not to think about Artemis. That Jesus is real. Jesus was flesh and blood of time. Jesus lived among us, and he did things for us, and it's not Artemis we were to see. And in Acts 20, as Paul was preparing, headed to Jerusalem to be arrested, not knowing if he's going to live or die, has a meeting with the elders from Ephesus, and they're very intimate. They're weeping and calling. They say, Why are you breaking my heart? They have this very Closeness about them. So a few, few years after that, roughly 10, Paul is now in prison in Rome. I'm sure if he's going to live or die, he might be killed. He is in prison in Rome. And he writes to this relatively young church what we just read. And he begins. And one of the things 
things that might help us as we go through this, I would encourage you to do this. It doesn't take that long. If you're reading it really fast, it's about 12 minutes. I wouldn't recommend reading it really fast, but if you feel like you only got 12 minutes to spare, then you can read it fast. If you read it really slow, it might take you 30 minutes. But it's about 18 minutes if you read at a fairly decent pace. It's not that long of your day, but if you read the letter to the Ephesians, I wonder twice a week as we go through this series. Get familiar with what Paul is writing to this young church. He doesn't have the rest of the New Testament. But what we have is Jesus. It doesn't really take long, but really do that. I learned recently that one of the challenges when we read familiar books is humans have a tendency to begin reading what we remember. And eventually, we end up reading what we expect. And we're not really reading the words anymore. Now, I can't recall that ever happening because I've forgotten that, but I thought about this with movies that you watch over and over. So there's a certain trilogy of movies that are the greatest movies that have ever been produced that I've watched about 18 times right now. And every now and then, I am sure that a certain character is going to say a certain word, and now because of my hearing, I put closed captioning up. And I was like, oh, I can't believe that's what he said. And you know what this? I, I can't even just hear what I expected. And all of a sudden, it's like, I'm so familiar with it that I'm no longer actually listening to it. And that can happen when we read, so we want to read. Now, if you read the book of Ephesians over the next couple of months, why is Paul saying what he is saying? One of the other things to remember as we read the book of Ephesians is that the majority of the earliest Christians were illiterate. And the majority of the earliest Christians did not have a copy of this. They didn't have mass printing presses. Which means that when they read the book of Ephesians, they were listening to someone who knew how to read, read it. So when they read it, they were listening. They were listening. The book would have been performed as a sermon in the early church. And we notice, as we read from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 6, that was read for us earlier on, armor of God. That what we just read in chapter 1 is moving us toward his final point in chapter 6. That what we read about what we have in Jesus is Paul introducing us to get to the point where the last day, the evil day, the difficult day against the devil, we may put on the whole armor of God. Able to stand. That we are going to be prepared to stand against the devil because of what we have in Jesus. Paul's going to say a lot in between, but we always know this is where he's bringing his church to be able to stand. Paul knows he's writing a sermon for the church there, but what we notice is what Paul thinks is important for the church to hear. And one of the things we notice when we look at the sermons in the Bible, it's not pointed at one or two people. It's always pointed at everybody in the audience. And whether it's evangelistic sermons like you read in the book of Acts, it's for everybody who is not believers there. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made a both Lord and Christ is Jesus who is crucified. Who is Peter God to? Everybody. The promise is for you and for your children. And for their children, for all who are far off, it's for everybody. Or when it's public service to the church, it's for everybody. To the saints who are at Ephesus, not to one or two people, to the church. To everybody. This sermon is for. And so when we gather and hear the word of God, our thoughts should never be simply on what so-and-so over there needs to hear. I remember sitting in the sermon one time, and 
Morris was preaching in Sunday. And he was laying it on. And I said, boy, that person over there really needs this. I'm feeling really good about it, you know. And then Morris said, maybe you're one of those Christians who thinks there's nothing wrong with you, but other people need to hear things. And I'm like, did he read my mind? <laughs> and I actually went up to him and I said, I'm really thankful you said that. And he needs to be taught that. It's not about what so and so needs to hear. When I go to hear the word of God, what do I need to hear? What do I need to hear? I have not reached the point where I have everything under complete control. I am not on cruise control. I'm reminded of still had to do whatever he could to grab hold of things. And it falls in that situation. There's still something for me to hear. Something for me to grasp. Something for me to work. Life is going 150 miles an hour, and I feel like I'm a bicycle with no front tires. Sometimes I need reminding, and sometimes I need to hear so And I stop. I needed to hear. That's doxy. That's doxy. And I can think 